Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Kelly Pirtle with NOAA Communications in Norman, Oklahoma, and I am your host for today's webinar. We are so excited you're joining us. Uh, it's springtime and my azaleas and tulips are blooming and it's windy here in Oklahoma. And most importantly, severe weather season has already begun, at least in parts of the United States, right? As we enter the busiest time of year for storms with strong winds, hail, and tornadoes, our researchers are focused on increasing our understanding of severe storms and improving the tools used by forecasters. Researchers from NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory and partners are taking instruments to the storms, collecting ex experimental radar data, and collaborating with partners in the NOAA hazardous weather testbed. These are amid our continued efforts to better observe and forecast severe weather. Each of today's eight panelists will have three minutes and one slide to briefly share information about their current research. You can see from the outline, after each group, we will take a break for questions from you, our audience. And at the end, all of the panelists will return to respond to your questions for a few minutes. At any point during the presentations, please submit your questions in writing using the questions pane of the GoToWebinar panel. Alan Gerard, Chief of the Warning Research and Development Division at the National Severe Storms Laboratory, will be taking your questions and sharing them with our presenters. We really want your questions. We are recording today's webinar, and it will be posted by Wednesday on the National Severe Storms Laboratory's homepage. I will put the link in the chat box. For reporters, we have B-roll available on the NSSL website also. Look for that link in the chat box as well. And we have photos on NSSL's Flickr page. You can get to that from the main lab webpage, www.nssl.noaa.gov. Scroll to the bottom for the link. We would love to get your feedback on this event. It's the first time we've done a webinar with all these different topics. Please take a moment at the conclusion of today's webinar to complete a very brief survey. All right, let's get started. The National Severe Storms Laboratory is undertaking two major field projects to study tornadoes this spring. The first is happening right now, and the team has already successfully collected data on three storm systems. We're going to start our webinar with an overview of that project called Perils, given by the person who is coordinating all of NOAA's involvement. Tony Liza is a postdoc at the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations here in Norman, also known as CERO, and I'm gonna call it CERO the rest of the webinar, working with the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. His research experience includes investigating the role of terrain on severe storm environments, observation analysis, of tornado producing squalline storms, something you're gonna hear more about, and tornado damage analysis. His research has focused on tornadoes that occur in the Southeast United States. Tony, tell us more about what you're doing. All right, uh, thank you, Kelly. So as Kelly said, uh, we have started the Perils Project. We actually began year one back on March 1st, and it will run through April 30th this spring. And this project, focuses on lines of storms that produce tornadoes, as opposed to the individual uh, supercell storms that have traditionally been studied on the Great Plains. One such example of one of these lines of storms are what we call quasi-linear convective systems, or QLCSs, as shown on the right here. This is from December of 2019, with two tornadoes that occurred north of Tupelo, Mississippi, highlighted on the right there. You can see the tighter circulations where the pink and the green are right next to each other. Next. So the project, the Perils Project, is focused across the southeastern United States, across a large area uh, from the uh, Missouri Boot Heel region down through the Delta regions of Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana, and down into the Acadiana and Atchafalaya River basins uh, down in southern Louisiana. So areas such as Greenville, Mississippi, Vicksburg, Lake Charles, and then over into the Black Belt and Tennessee Valley regions of Northeast Mississippi, Central Alabama, and North Alabama. So Huntsville, Montgomery, Selma, and Columbus, Mississippi. So it's an expansive area where we can place radars, uh, wind profiling instruments to get wind shear information, and a, 
whole bunch of other instruments to understand the atmosphere. Next. So the Perils Project is going to uh, investigate three uh, broad topics. The first topic here is, is the near storm environment. So we want to know how the atmosphere ahead of these lines of storms varies, how it may vary over space, over different areas ahead of a line of storms, and how it may change as the line of storms approaches, which leads to the second or the next objective, which is the, the actual storms themselves. How do these storms evolve? How do these lines of storms evolve? How do circulations within these lines form? Which circulations within these lines might produce tornadoes and which might not? And how does that relate to the environments ahead of the storms and processes within the storms, such as the development of precipitation, of rainfall, of hail, and the, the uh, development of the updrafts and downdrafts, or the upward and downward motions within these line, uh, longer lines of storms. And then the last or the final objective is looking at the damage. So once the line of storms has moved through uh, wherever we're studying for a given event, we're going out and assessing the damage left behind because we want to understand how to different, better differentiate well, what damage is produced by tornadoes with these lines of storms, what damage is different, uh, produced by straight line or non-tornadic winds, and then how, does, how do tornadoes within these lines of storms how are they affected by uh, things such as forest cover, land cover, terrain, buildings, um, and, and other obstructions that they might encounter? And how do those, those features, the forest, the trees, the buildings, react to being impacted by tornadoes and, and other severe winds? So it's a really a comprehensive project that looks at both ahead of the storms, ahead of, you know, how the environment uh, evolves ahead of a line of storms to how these storms themselves evolve and then the damage that is left behind. So it's a really a fascinating uh, collaborative uh, project spanning uh, NOAA, the NSF, and about uh, 10 universities to study this and to really uh, investigate in detail how these, these storm, lines of storms evolve. Um, and produce uh, significant severe weather and tornado hazards across the Southeast United States. Thank you, Tony. Now you'll hear from Matt Flournoy, a research scientist at CERO. His research focuses on better understanding severe storm dynamics, particularly supercells and tornadoes. He has been involved in several field campaigns with the Severe Storms Laboratory, most recently Taurus in 2019, as a Winsund mission team lead, which involved launching small balloons with instruments attached near storms. Matt? All right, thanks so much, Kelly. Um, like she said, I'll take this uh, brief opportunity to talk to you about the Taurus field campaign. So first and foremost, um, Taurus stands for the targeted observation using radar and UAS in supercells. Um, so this campaign is funded by NSF. Uh, like Kelly said, it started in 2019 and then has been delayed for the past couple of years due to COVID until this year. So this will be the second and last year of data collection for Taurus. The main goal of Taurus is to better understand supercell thunderstorms, so kind of complementarily to, to Perils, which focuses on linear storm modes. Taurus focuses on your perhaps more classic supercell thunderstorms. The domain is in the plains, um, southern, uh, central, and northern plains. Um, during May and June this year. The goal is to uh, transect storm-generated boundaries, both at the surface and aloft in the boundary layer, to better understand how the storm-generated boundaries influence surface rotation. So some of the storm-generated boundaries that we're focused on um, have been the object of prior field studies, um, like the rear flank gust front, for example, on kind of the, the southern edge of the storm, typically for supercell storms, but also on what we call the left flank of the storm, typically to the north of the low-level updraft or mesocyclone or tornado, if there's a tornado, there may be some boundaries lurking in that region that haven't really been studied that much on prior field campaigns, kind of like Vortex 2 is probably the most similar, most recent project related to Taurus. So the goal of Taurus is to use all these instruments to transect, um, for the most part, these boundaries and better understand them. So part of those transecting teams kind of shown on, um, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side there, will be surface um, mobile mesonets, so trucks and other vehicles with uh, mesonet racks on top of them, 
driving generally east and west through these boundaries. And also one of the um, kind of novel aspects of this project are UAS vehicles, so unmanned aerial systems that are flying above those vehicles that can actually collect in situ observations, especially thermodynamic observations for some of the first time in that area of the storm to better characterize these boundaries and their impact on the development of near surface rotation. An important point of this project is that it's not focused solely on tornadoes. We still have a lot to learn about non-tornadic storms too, because a lot of non-tornadic storms still have near surface rotation. And if we can better understand why that near surface rotation maybe doesn't develop into tornadoes, that's equally um, as useful, I think, to the community right now as better understanding tornadoes too. So the main outcomes of this project are to use all these um, instrumentation platforms to collect comprehensive data sets, especially in situ at the surface and slightly above the surface too, data sets in these regions of the storm to better characterize these boundaries and how they influence the development of near surface rotation. Thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions after the next talk. Thank you, Matt. I, I believe um, that Taurus is also funded by NOAA, just like um, Perils is NSF and NOAA funded. Um, so our next presenter is Kim Clocko McLean. She is a research scientist with CERO and team lead for the Behavioral Insights Unit at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. She specializes in behavioral science focused on weather and climate risk, especially issues in the communication of forecast uncertainty and hazardous weather warnings. She pursues this research through mixed methodologies, including post-event interviews, surveys, focus groups, and experiments. We'd like to hear more about that, Kim. Thank you so much, Kelly. So today I'm going to be talking about a newer kind of field work for our discipline, and this is social science field work. As we all know, meteorology has many standardized instruments and shared data at its disposal to observe and understand the atmosphere. We do not, however, have this in the social sciences applied to meteorology. So for example, when tornadoes occur and meteorologists invariably turn to us and ask, what happened? Did anything go wrong? It's very hard for us in the social sciences to speak to the specifics. And that makes it very hard for our whole enterprise to learn how to improve our communication. Over a thousand tornadoes occur in the US annually. And of those, less than 1% are ever studied from the human perspective. What did people know, feel, and do during these events? And the social scientists who do go to the field are uncoordinated and don't, sh don't use shared instruments. They also face significant barriers to sharing and pooling their data, even if they wanted to, because the human subjects protection issues involved. This makes it hard to compare findings from one event to other events. We're tackling this gap in two ways. First, by creating a standardized instrument, and second, by generating novel approaches for reaching people who've been affected by tornadic storms, who are often very difficult to reach. The instrument is a brief field deployable survey that was created by a team of social science researchers from across the US. We recognized that we wanted NOAA, a federal agency with federal employees, to be able to collect this data. This requires a special form of human subjects approval from the OMB. We received this approval happily um, to conduct this study last winter. And so this spring, we will deploy this survey in a variety of ways. The first way that we're piloting this year is through the National Weather Service, with six offices that have volunteered to try this out across the central and southern region. As weather service forecasters conduct damage surveys, and if they have time and encounter survivors who want to talk with them, they'll collect their stories through this tool. This is a capability many in the Weather Service have long wanted, and we've been so excited to work alongside them to develop this tool for their use in the field. Additionally, NSSL has created a citizen science web application called Tornado Tales. Anyone who is in or around a potentially tornadic storm can share their experiences with us, similar to the USGS Did You Feel It web app. The questions in this app are the same as the questions weather service forecasters will use, allowing for direct comparability of responses. Between these two efforts, we anticipate collecting data from a much larger set of events and a much more representative set of events. We want to know what people do in EF zeros and EF ones just as much, if not more, as what they do in stronger and often more certain events. We're excited to contribute a first of its kind data set to the weather and research communities through this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. It's uh, now time for some questions. Uh, Alan Gerard is going to help uh, uh, with those. 
Uh, remember, you can type your questions in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, Alan? I hope I... Yep, I'm here. Okay. Sorry, just had to, okay. just had to unmute. <laughs> Checking in the questions to see if we get any. Uh, while we're waiting to see if we have any questions, um, I have some questions. So I'll start with uh, Tony and ask if you could um, maybe just give an overview of the deployments we've had so far and have we had successful ones yet? Yeah, absolutely. So we've done three deployments, what we call intensive operating periods or IOPs so far. Um, the first one was along the Mississippi-Alabama border, west of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The second one was a little bit farther north, uh, centered around Columbus and Starkville, Mississippi. And then the third one, which was just this past Tuesday, was around Montgomery, Alabama. In the first IOP, we had five tornadoes within our observing domain, the strongest being an EF3 in Kemper County, Mississippi. The, in the second one, we had two tornadoes that were right in the middle of our observing domain, the strongest being a high-end EF2 tornado in Noxabee County, Mississippi. And in the third one, we've had at least four tornadoes confirmed within our observing domain. Uh, the strongest being an EF2 in Montgomery and Pike counties in Alabama. So we've had um, a wildly successful data observing period so far. I gathered information on tornadoes from all sorts of different type of both QLCS uh, or you know, linear circulations and even some supercell circulations from storms that formed ahead of these lines of storms we were we were targeting. So um, you know, obviously, we, we do not like to see the damage or the devastation left behind, especially in the stronger tornadoes. But from a data collection perspective, things couldn't be couldn't be going much better for the project. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. Like you say, we hate to see the damage but and the impact, but um, obviously, we want to try to be out there to study and learn what we can so that we can help people the next time. Um, Matt, uh, a question for you. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about the safety aspect of what you all do and um, and essentially what you do out in the field to keep everyone safe? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, safety is the first and foremost concern. No data is worth. Um, anyone's uh, risk to their to their safety at all so obviously we're operating in a pretty dangerous area of the storm with um tornadoes potentially and strong winds and also hail so there's a there's several precautions that we take when we're out there um obviously first and foremost is training so in each of these vehicles there will be someone if not multiple people out of each crew that have been in that area of the storm before and are capable of leading a mission and they're comfortable being in that area and, and navigating it um, there will be at least one or two people probably in the backseat of these vehicles who honestly their their primary job is probably going to be looking out the window <laughs> and just making sure that there's nothing too crazy happening because sometimes things can happen fairly quickly in that part of the storm and um, the the safest thing to do is just use your eyes don't don't use radar scope use your eyes and make sure you can see what's happening um, and then also um, in terms of the hail um, there are hail cages outfitted on on many of the vehicles that are performing near storm missions um, to try and protect the windshields especially from hail because if, if you get a hailstone in the wrong spot and it breaks the windshield then that that's a risk in and of itself and also you can't really see very well so that kind of immediately compromises the vehicle and the safety of folks in the car so physically there are some safety precautions there with respect to the hail cages to to protect um, folks that way as well it doesn't necessarily protect the mesonet instruments on top so much but those don't matter as much as the people inside so those are just a few of the things that um, we do to make sure that people are as safe as they can be while collecting data in that part of the storm awesome thank you matt and uh kim a question for you can you uh can you give a little more detail uh, especially if any of them are on uh listening today on how forecast offices can get involved if they'd like to be a part of the pilot project? 
Absolutely. If there are still offices that aren't involved um, and who would like to be, Lauren Nash, the WCM at the New Orleans Forecast Office, has been our point person there. And she's really closely tied in with the Weather Service Central Region and Southern Region um, coordinating on this. There was a uh, WCM uh, sort of all hands where she presented about this and solicited volunteers. Um, so you might have heard about it that way. That's what this effort is. If you're still interested, it's absolutely not too late to still get involved. And um, Lauren and I are providing some, some guidance and training uh, for anyone who is interested in being a part of it. Awesome, thank you. I'm uh, looking again to see, uh, we did have one, one question and I think you could probably cover this real quick, Matt, before we start back up. Uh, can you uh, outline what the domain is for the tourist study? Oh yeah, um, I could try and find it on my computer real quick, but I'll just speak from memory. I think, so it's expanded from prior studies like Vortex 2, so the domain pretty much extends from Texas and Oklahoma, all the way up through southern North Dakota, and I believe into portions of eastern Montana and eastern Wyoming as well. So it's a pretty large expanse, and one of the biggest expansions with respect to Vortex 2, which was over 10 years ago now, was um, the regions in which the UASs could fly. So that's kind of the probably the biggest upgrade in terms of the aerial extent of where we're, we're able to go. So pretty much anywhere and where you'd expect your typical Great Plains region to be um, is, is what we can cover in Taurus. Awesome. All right, well, seeing no additional questions, uh, thank you all for the great presentations and your answers, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Kelly. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, you guys. Um, remember, you can type your question in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we'll now transition to our next group. The next three presenters are all involved in research conducted in the NOAA hazardous weather testbed. The HWT is both a physical space in the National Weather Center as well as a conceptual framework designed to foster collaboration between research and operations and to test and evaluate emerging technologies and science. Our next speaker, Adam Clark, is a research meteorologist at the National Severe Storms Laboratory. One of his main roles is serving as NSSL's lead coordinator for the annual spring forecasting experiments, which is a topic of his presentation. Adam? Hi, everybody. Kelly, thanks for that introduction. So NOAA's Hazardous Weather Testbed Spring Forecasting Experiments, or SFEs, are five-week-long severe weather forecasting and model evaluation experiments that are coordinated and led by NSSL and NOAA's Storm Prediction Center. We hold them at the peak of the severe weather season and typically involve over 100 participants. Our 2021 experiment had over 130 meteorologists from around the world, and our upcoming experiment, which will be held May 2nd through June 3rd, already has almost 150 people signed up. So this will be the third year in a row that we've conducted the experiments virtually because of COVID restrictions. In some ways, the virtual experiments have been advantageous. For example, without the physical space limitations, we've been able to recruit a record number of people. However, a disadvantage is that it's a lot harder to have impromptu science discussions and establish new collaborations in the virtual environment. So when we get back to the in-person experiments, we really hope to leverage the tools that we've learned from the virtual workplace to enhance in-person experiments, and then maybe even use them in some kind of a hybrid format where we have parts of the experiment that are, are done virtually. So the main goals of the SFEs are to accelerate research to operations through several avenues. The first is testing new severe weather prediction tools and forecasting methods. This involves forecasters and researchers working together to issue experimental products in real time, uh, the same way an operational forecaster would. So the second avenue is studying how end users apply severe weather guidance. And this involves social scientists that study things like product preferences and how forecasters use and interpret different kinds of guidance. Finally, the third avenue is facilitating experiments for optimizing the forecast models that are used by the National Weather Service. So the 
these experiments, they have a long history of success and they've become a model for similar types of experiments around the world. Uh, the success comes from the sense of realism and operational urgency. In the HWT, we use the same types of workstations, we abide by similar time constraints, and we issue products uh, similar to the way that operational forecasters do. For researchers, this can be really eye-opening. Forecasters are under a lot of pressure and they have to make decisions using limited data, which is something that some researchers often don't truly appreciate until they actually experience it. Um, another thing that makes it a success uh, is that we make a really big effort to have diverse participant backgrounds. So we put people together that would normally never interact with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And the pictures uh, on the slide, uh, especially the ones on the right side, are meant to illustrate this. Finally, the hazardous weather test bed uh, is really effective at facilitating what we call research to operations and operations to research pathways. So we aren't just trying to force new products on forecasters, we're learning how forecasters use new tools so that we can enhance our own research uh, and make it better suited for its intended users. So it really is this two-way pathway of research to operations and then operations to research. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Next, we'll hear from Cody Berry. Cody is the FACETS Program Lead at the National Severe Storms Lab. She is also acting as the Executive Officer of NOAA's Hazardous Weather Testbed. She's going to tell us about FACETS and the research they're doing this year. Thanks, Kelly. FACETS, or Forecasting a Continuum of Environmental Threats, is a next-generation forecast and warning framework that's designed to communicate clear and simple hazardous weather information to the public. And this information extends from days before to within minutes of an event, and it's for all environmental hazards. Facet severe is focused on severe convective weather, such as tornadoes, hail, wind, and lightning. The experimental warning program of NOAA's hazardous weather test bed focuses on detection and prediction of severe weather hazards. And this year we have three virtual experiments in the experimental warning program that focus on the facets paradigm for severe weather warnings. The first step in advancing severe weather warning information is threats in motion or TIM. Threats in motion is a new warning generation approach that would enable the National Weather Service to advance severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings from the current static polygon system to a more rapidly updating polygon that moves forward with the storm. We just completed a virtual threats in motion experiment in March called Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim extends the capabilities within the National Weather Service's current convective warning framework by allowing severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings to extend in time and area for the first time. This experiment allowed four forecasters over two weeks to test new software that updates warning polygons about every 10 minutes. Coming up later this summer, we will have the Hazard Services TIM experiment. And in this experiment, the threats and motion warnings update as fast as every minute. We should be advertising for National Weather Service forecasters to apply to participate in this experiment later this month. Probabilistic hazard information, or FEE, are continuously updating probabilistic hazard grids. FEE can be used to provide custom user-specific products that can be tailored to adapt to a variety of needs. An example being providing longer severe thunderstorm lead time or tornado lead times at lower confidence for more vulnerable populations that have a lower tolerance for risk. The FEE experiments allow National Weather Service forecasters to assess a new tool using rapidly updating hazard probabilities. These experiments test concepts related to human-computer interaction while generating warnings and storm-based probabilities. One example being the probability of a storm producing one-inch hail, 60-mile-an-hour winds, or a tornado over the next hour, where the computer guidance is generated using machine learning models. This spring, the Hazardous Weather Test Bed will have 18 forecasters over three weeks evaluating this tool and the use of hazard probabilities, not only for their own guidance and warning decision making, but also as a severe weather product for the public. Many experiments in the HWT are funded through competitive grants supported by NOAA's Weather Program Office, and you can find more information about the HWT online at hwt.nssl.noaa.gov and follow us on Twitter at NOAA underscore HWT. Thanks.
Thank you, Cody. Our third speaker in this group is Patrick Burke. He is a researcher who helps lead a large team of scientists working on a next generation modeling ECMO. This research project aims to increase lead time for tornado, severe thunderstorm, and flash flood warnings. Tell us more about that, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. I'm so glad everyone's here today to learn more about NSSL and about Warn on Forecast. So, Warn on Forecast system, or we'll just call it WAFS for short, is a an ensemble numerical weather prediction model. So it's a weather model, but it's making forecasts of individual thunderstorms and their hazards using some techniques that have never been tried before in weather operations. So let's first take a look at why we need to invent such a special system like this. When you receive a severe weather warning, whether it's for hail or tornadoes or flash floods, that almost always means that either a trained storm spotter or Doppler weather radar has detected a specific threat. And so using these detection methods, the best we can do for lead time is about maybe 10 or 20 minutes on average. And naturally, in our science, we wonder, what if we could provide more lead time, 60 minutes or 90 minutes? Uh, maybe in that case, we could more easily evacuate places like stadiums or mobile home parks where large numbers of people are vulnerable to severe weather. And the way that meteorologists attempt to gain lead time is with weather models. But while we have weather models that are very good at predicting large things like cold fronts or low pressure systems, uh, predicting individual thunderstorms and their hazards at the city and county level is much more difficult. So we designed WAFs with some special capabilities, and you'll see some of those here in this looping image. WAFs operates on a smaller domain. It's about the size of the four corner states. And so we can um, hit that question of forecasting individual storms with a lot of computer power. Most weather models forecast for the entire country, whereas we're very focused on the severe weather. And we can move that domain anywhere around the country on a given day to follow the threats. So to keep pace with severe weather, WAFS also reads in new radar and satellite data every 15 minutes and churns out an entirely new set of forecast products every 30 minutes. And these unique visualizations like you're seeing here can tell us which of the severe weather hazards are greatest and or more likely and where they're likely to happen. And with uh, images every five minutes into the forecast, these loops end up looking more like movies, which really tell the story of how severe weather is likely to evolve. And so in experimental operations over the last few years, and during the test bed experiments, uh, this technology has already been enabling forecasters in real time to provide more specific uh, forecasts and warnings at greater lead time. And so I'm showing you an example here, which many of you may remember uh, from August of 2020. This was the Iowa derecho, or a, a very large windstorm that devastated crops and caused a lot of damage. Um, this was actually the costliest single thunderstorm uh, system that's on record in the United States. And we're on forecast showed that this ability to read in new radar and satellite information in the hours preceding the storm was critical to making an accurate prediction of this very, very high impact uh, weather event. So this is one of the ways that forecasters are using Warn on Forecast. And you too can interact with the system. Uh, this spring, as you heard Adam uh, mention, uh, we'll be running WAFs during the spring forecasting experiment from May 2nd to June 3rd. And if you follow on Twitter at NOAA NSSL, then you can receive updates each day as to where we've uh, placed the domain for severe weather. And there are plenty of uh, other things you can read on the WAFs website, uh, tutorials, and uh, just generally uh, enjoy looking at this new technology as we experiment with it this spring. There's one other thing I did want to mention. Um, one of the, the key uh, uh, milestones this year is that we're now running the system on a cloud-based computer system, um, which will allow us to do more runs of this model over more areas of the country. So we're looking forward to discovering more things like we did here with the Iowa derecho. Thank you, Patrick. That's very exciting. Uh, thank you all for your questions, too. Uh, we're ready to uh, address some of those, Alan. What questions do you have? 
Yes, we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, first one, I think, is just for for any of the panelists who might want to answer a uh, question about uh, satellite data and do we uh, use or test any satellite uh, collected data in uh, our research? I can go ahead and chime in on that one. We do have an individual satellite experiment every spring that operates in the months of May and early June. And it is dedicated solely to um, testing different satellite data. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit too, Alan. Um, so we have a, a researcher, Thomas Jones, who works closely with NOAA and with NASA to bring satellite data into our worn on forecast system. And this is really important when it comes to identifying exactly where the storms are currently before we launch a forecast. We use something called cloud water path data from the satellite, and uh, it's, it's a really unique use of that data. Awesome. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, the next question is specifically for Cody asking, how quickly do you anticipate the FACETS program to lead to implementation? I knew Cody That's, would like this question. Yes, it's a it's a tricky question um, because as a, as a whole, FACETS isn't, it's not that like one day FACETS will be implemented. Um, there are many things that fall under the umbrella of facets that span across, you know, days before to within minutes of. So we're talking warning scale, outlook scale, in between watch and warning, all of that technically falls under the facets umbrella. And so it will very much be sort of like stepwise implementation, um, you know, like Things like threats in motion being a really important first step before we can get more detailed information that is rapidly rapidly updating. Um, so I, it will be a progression, I would say, over the next several years. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question here uh, for Adam. What what do you think is the most uh, pro promising tool or, uh, that you're testing in the spring forecasting experiment right now? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, well, one specific tool, and you know, Patrick just talked about it, but we're testing more forecast in the test bed. So we've been doing that for several years now, and I would say it's uh, it's got a, a lot of potential to really revolutionize how the weather service issues warnings and issues other types of guidance kind of in the you know zero to six hour lead time range uh, but another general thing that we've been testing too is different methods for using artificial intelligence and forecasting so that's become a really kind of blossoming area of research and especially in the last two or three years i would say it's shown a lot of potential to help enhance a lot of the guidance from numerical models, including the guidance from Warner Forecast. So I think you know, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning methods for forecasting are gonna become uh, really impactful here in the next five to 10 years. Okay, thanks, Adam. And related to Warner on Forecast, one more question. Uh, this one, I think more for Patrick. Uh, Obviously, we, we've touched on uh, how worn-on forecast could help for uh, tornado and severe thunderstorm forecasting. Can you uh, talk about any other potential applications it has? Sure, Alan. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, honestly, the sky's the limit with this system. It's it's such a new type of model um, because it provides uh, the probability of different things happening. Right. Normally, when you run a model, it gives you one answer of a particular scenario, but we're running the model 18 times over and producing all these different scenarios, which gives you a measure of how certain or uncertain each event is. So we've, we've seen um, forecasters applying this to strong wind events that create wildfire outbreaks. Um, we've seen a lot of application to flash flood forecasting. And um, like I said, the sky's the limit. There's many other areas we could get into.
All right, thanks, Patrick, and thanks to all the panelists and to the audience for the great questions. I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Kelly for our next uh, series of presentations. Thanks, everybody. Uh, our next speaker is Chris Schwartz. He is a meteorologist with CERO and works with a team of engineers at the University of Oklahoma and the National Severe Storms Lab as the radar operations coordinator. He will discuss the Advanced Technology Demonstrator, an experimental radar that will be collecting data on storms in central Oklahoma this spring. Chris? Thank you, Kelly. I'm here to tell you about the newest research radar at NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory called the Advanced Technology Demonstrator, or ATD. The ATD is the first of its kind, marrying together two of the most important recent advances in weather radar, dual polarization and phased array. Dual polarization is a technique pioneered at NSSL in the 1980s and now operational across the National Weather Service. It gives forecasters more information about what is being observed. For example, to discriminate between regions of rain, sleet, and snow in a winter storm. The first use of phased array for weather observations also occurred at NSSL in the early 2000s with the use of an adapted 1970s military phased array radar. It was proven that phased array radar allows more flexible scanning without the need for moving parts. This enables faster scans and the ability to adapt the scan strategy to the weather being observed. The tower on the left houses the ATD on the University of Oklahoma's research campus in Norman, Oklahoma. If you take a look under the radar in the center pictures, the first thing you will notice is that it looks nothing like a conventional spinning dish radar. Instead, we have a flat panel array composed of thousands of small antennas that all work together to steer the radar beam in any direction we want without the need for moving parts. As you can imagine, this was a major undertaking involving many years of research and development from all the organizations you see represented in the ATD's logo of logos at the top right. Design and production took about four years of work from NSSL, Lincoln Laboratories, General Dynamics, and the Cooperative Institute, now known as CERO, before the pieces were finally brought together and installed in Norman in 2018. Thereafter, it was still another three years of integration and rigorous testing to prove that the system was calibrated and the weather products could be trusted. The image on the right is actual reflectivity data taken from the ATD mere hours after the final test to declare the system operational and qualified for meteorological research. This hailstorm came crashing through the radar site, destroying the roof and windows of the adjacent office building, but not before we captured striking radar imagery with the ATD. Fortunately, the ATD itself did not suffer damage. In a case like this, the combination of dual polarization and phased array radar promises to give our researchers new insight into the evolution of storms by providing dual pole information up to four to five times faster than the current operational weather service radars. I should emphasize that this is a research radar. This is the first spring with other meteorologists' involvement in data collection with the ATD and we plan on collecting on a wide array of severe storms to further their various research interests. The ATD will be one of NSSL's major weather research tools for the next decade or more, but is not used in weather service operations. However, we do hope it also serves as a pathfinder for what the next generation of operational weather radars may look like. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris. I asked this final speaker to join today's webinar because he's been doing a lot of interviews on this topic lately. Uh, Harold Brooks is a senior scientist at the National Severe Storms Lab. His primary research interests are in forecast verification, extended range forecasting of hazardous thunderstorms, as well as climate change and severe thunderstorms, the topic he is going to tell us more about. Harold? Thank you, Kelly. Um, and You've heard a little bit about essentially looking at individual storms now. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of background of what we think we know about, about storms historically and what's been going on. And one of the first questions we get asked is, have are there more tornadoes now than there used to be? And if we actually, we know that we change the way we collect our reports all the time. Uh, and that, may, that leads to some artificial changes. But if we eliminate and disregard the weakest tornadoes, the F-Zero tornadoes that are typically weak and short-lived and don't cause very much damage, we find that since the 1960s, 1950s, we actually have averaged about 500 F1 or stronger tornadoes each year in the United States with no trend going on. Uh, there has been a rel there's been an increase in the variability of tornadoes, 
uh, occurring in the in the in recent years with some of the biggest years and some of the smallest years occurring in the last decade. But what we have seen is the change in the way they're distributed during the year. Uh, on the bottom panel here, the number of days per year in black uh, that have at least one EF1 tornado occurring on it peaked at around 150 in the 1970s. And we're now down to about 100 days per year. So a loss of, of, of one third of the number of days with at least one tornado occurring. But on the other hand, the number of days with a lot of tornadoes, and here I'm just saying more than uh, 15, has increased from roughly four days per year to eight days per year. And combined, this has led, helped lead to having the, the, the same total number of tornadoes during the year. We also get asked the question a lot of, is Tornado Alley moving? And one of the things that's really important to know is that Tornado Alley is not a real well-defined concept. And when people have drawn maps of Tornado Alley, it's never actually been about just where tornadoes occur. This is a map from using data from 1921 to 1935 from Tom Grizzoulis that shows the frequency of tornado occurrence, of strong violent tornado occurrence in the United States. And what you see is sort of this L shape in the middle. And actually in that period, the absolute maximum of tornado occurrence was, was over central Arkansas, a little more than one day per every three years or 35 days per century occurring with that. So that's important to keep in mind that we haven't, that it's always been there, but tornadoes occurring in the Southeast. But we have seen a change in the number of tornadoes occurring over the Mid-South region. Sort of think of Memphis and maybe a couple hundred miles surrounding it. And on the left-hand side, this is the number of reports of tornadoes gridded, uh, changing from 1979 to 2016. Red represents going up. And on the right side are actually environmental conditions, that they have also increased in a similar pattern over the, over the Mid-South and a decrease over West Texas and Kansas. And it's important that the environments show that this isn't just a change in our reporting practices. But it's important to keep in mind that this is roughly 10% changes over those 40 years so that for an individual, they might see one more event or one less event during the course of their lifetime. Thank you very much. And that's all I have today. Thank you, Harold. That answers some questions, I think. All right, um, Chris, join us again. And Alan, do you have some uh, questions for us? I do. Uh, it looks like we have a radar question for Chris. Um, uh, one of our uh, audience members wants to know, with no moving parts, how are you able to collect 360 degrees worth of data? And can you get different tilts similar to NEXRAD? So currently, we only have one flat face on the ATD. In concept, the idea was to have four full faces. That is something that is still being explored. We do have the ability to scan electronically in both azimuth and elevation. So we can steer our radar beam any direction up to 90 degrees, plus or minus 45 degrees about azimuth and, plus or, and basically up to about 45 degrees um, in electronic elevation scans. Okay, thanks, Chris. I'm just sorry. I'm reading. Oh, we got another question here. This one's for Harold. Uh, the negative change in tornado environment in Texas, could that be related to persistent drought? It likely is. Uh, that's one of the big questions you're right now. It's very, very difficult to get to tornadoes to sort of large scale climate change uh, because the, the ingredients just change in really interesting ways. But it's likely that as that the drier Persistent dryness has moved a little bit further east than it used to be. All right, we got another question here that I believe is for Harold. Uh, the tornado variability has changed in distribution during the year. Have you also collected data on wind events, such as straight line wind events, during the same period of study? It's unfortunate that the quality of our wind event databases. Uh, not very good. Uh, it, it turns out that that's just a much more difficult thing to get to collect information on. It, it's something we'd like to look at a little bit more because the the peak of the really strong winds uh, tends to be a much narrower peak than tornadoes. Most of almost all of the, the strong straight line wind events in the United States take place in in late spring and early summer. But it's unfortunately our data our database just isn't as good for that. A 
questions. Uh, going back to the radar for Chris, uh, if you could look into a crystal ball, what do you hope to see happening with the ATD in five to 10 years? Well, I hope that the use of the ATD over the next five to 10 years helps research meteorologists develop better understandings of storm evolution and that it will be used to aid in the development of new radar algorithms and scanning techniques that can one day be implemented across the National Weather Service. Uh, we have a follow-up uh, on a question for Chris. Uh, will phased array radar have the same effective range as NEXRAD? And will data be, put, be pushed to end users every five minutes during active weather, or will the updates be more frequent? Uh, as far as the uh, effective range, uh, yes, currently our uh, <clears throat> current radar can extend out from Norman, Oklahoma. I don't know if you know where that's at, but it can see it about as far out um, to Texas, which is pretty optimal for uh, forecasters and DFO. And the um, what was the second question, Alan? Um, will data be pushed out every five minutes or will uh, it be more frequent? That's really dependent. Um, I think that that's something that will really need to be kind of a, a investigated as to see uh, how much data can be handled by a forecaster. I know that previous experiments have kind of touched on that topic, but I think that's really just going to depend on the forecaster's desire to uh, choose their scan strategy. So to get faster updates would obviously mean more data output. Okay. All right, thanks, Chris and Harold. I'm going to ask the all of the panelists, please rejoin and open it up here for a few minutes for uh, questions to the entire panel. If anybody from the audience has anything that they've thought of from earlier presentations that they'd like to ask. Um, I actually, let me go back. Uh, we did have a question earlier that uh, we missed, I think is for Matt, uh, asking about live data from Taurus deployments. That Perils provided live data from the DAOs uh, on a web page. Will any sort of data like that be available for Taurus? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure on, on radar data. I don't think that radar data will be posted online anywhere. Um, but I'm not in charge of the radar specifically. So if I'm wrong on that, then <laughs> someone please correct me. But I do know that some of the data that's collected during Taurus, specifically like sounding data, for example, is um, often shared directly with local forecast offices that can then incorporate it into, for example, like mesoscale discussions from the SPC or, or things like that. So some of that is used in quasi real time in some situations. Looking to see if we have any other questions. Um, Kelly, I don't see any other questions. Did you have anything you wanted to? Uh, yes, we have one more with? for Harold. Um, our are, are we expecting a busy spring with a lot of tornadoes? Well, I, I think the it, it, it obviously gets harder the further out we, we look. It appears that uh, the next month will probably be above normal um, and continue the pattern we've seen over the last, over the last few weeks. Uh, but May is always a much harder month to predict in, in advance uh, just because of the, the way the atmosphere changes. Our, our best predictability for long range is actually February and March uh, in sort of those shoulder seasons. And by the time we get to the end of April, our predictability in the long range is minimal thank you for that i have another one <laughs> um adam what are the advantages and disadvantages of virtual experiments and cody could probably answer that too maybe even patrick yeah um our first virtual experiment you know we were kind of testing the water so we didn't invite that many people to it but then we realized that this was a huge opportunity and so the second one, we were just, we left it open to anybody that wanted to participate. And we, we got a, a 
a ton of people, a record number. So uh, just being able to broaden uh, the scope of the experiments and have more people participate is a huge advantage. Um, probably the biggest disadvantage uh, is that, you know, when you don't, when you're not together with people in person, it's so much harder, you know, to develop relationships with them and new collaborations. And we kind of call it like the intangibles of the spring experiment. You know, it is all these things, these like magical things that happen when you're together um, with these really interesting people, you know, like in person. Um, and so that's probably the biggest disadvantage is not being able to have that type of atmosphere. Um, but we're kind of hoping, you know, when we go back to work in person, that we can create something that is like the best of both worlds. I will add in that with the use of AWIPS in the cloud, that we don't have to worry so much about, you know, in-person experiments can be dictated by the travel budget. But when we're doing something like AWIPS in the cloud, that cost restriction is removed. And so we can have a lot more people involved and it's also more accessible. Um, I like to use the example, we've had a forecaster who had a newborn at home, which, you know, had we been in person, they would not have been able to take a week away and travel out of state and come and participate in the experiment, but because it was happening within the walls of their home, they were able to participate. Um, plus we got to, to see the new baby. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's been one big benefit. Um, I would say a tricky aspect is that normally when we're in the physical space of the hazardous weather test bed, if anything goes wrong, wrong technically, somebody can just walk up and say, hey, let me sit down at your workstation and troubleshoot. And in the virtual environment, they're trying to look at the person's screen and then give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to try to troubleshoot whatever's going on with their AWIPS instance. So it can be trickier that way. Yeah, those are great points, Cody. <laughs> All right, I think, um... I think we'll end with that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alan, for leading our questions and thank you everybody for answering the questions. Uh, that wraps today's webinar. As we end, please stay on for one more minute to answer a few brief questions that will appear on your screen. Your feedback really is helpful as we plan future webinars like this one. And a big, big thanks to all of our wonderful panelists today, Alan for help with the questions and James Renan for running our slides, as well as you, our audience. I hope you have learned something new. Thanks again for your participation and have a fine day.